Let's look at our next situation now. This is hockey punching without the punches. The attacker's gonna get a hold of you with two hands this time. Obviously, since he's using his hands to hold you, he's not gonna be able to hit you with them, but he has more control of your body to make it more dangerous. It's natural for him to try and pull you into a knee to the groin or a headbutt. According to some top 10 studies, that happens fairly frequently. It's up in their top six or seven. Go ahead. So the problem here with this situation is instead of dividing it into different attacks, at least I know he's not gonna punch me unless he lets go. So I have to worry about his kicks and his headbutt. Uh, the, for your first line of defense for all headbutts is just a relationship between your head and his. Let's let go for a second. We're about the same height, so this is a dangerous situation. If he's standing here, he can line up a headbutt. A lot of people, especially aggressive ones, are taller than I am. I'm about 5'9", so I go around the world where the bullies are slightly taller than me. If the guy's head is here, I don't have to worry about it because my head is naturally here. It's very difficult for him to headbutt me. But if, if he's lined up with you at this height where the hard part of his head can reach your head, I have to always be aware that dropping my chin is the last line of defense I have. All right, I want him to make contact like this. Or if there's a big height difference, you can see how problematic it is for a guy to headbutt you. Just be aware that you want the hard part of your head, everything from the brow ridges up and particularly above your hairline. This is the hardest bone in your body, so it's really not a problem getting, getting headbutted there. You want to always keep that below him. So when he grabs you like that, although I'm going to be talking through this segment, I want you to think that anything you're doing at this time, you want to make sure your chin is down and that you're not worried about the headbutt. Now, in order for him to either knee me or headbutt me, I have to be in line with him. We did some of the other um, self-defense techniques, like dropping my head through. If I suspect he's going to knee me and I feel the pressure, it's probably not a good idea to start putting my head under. I may run into it. So let's look at the most basic one that's taught in almost all Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu schools. A lot of people don't like it. I think the problem is they don't put it in the proper context. What this does is allow me to absorb heavy pressure from this person and at the same time make sure that I'm not in line with him where he can't knee me and can't headbutt me. So if he starts pushing on me really hard, it's going to be difficult for me to withstand that. All right, But by making a simple adjustment in the relationship between our bodies, it's almost impossible for him to move me backwards. So as he starts to push, I'm going to go here, push hard, hard, hard. Okay, that's the proper use of this classic breakout technique. All right, let's look at it in detail. He grabs me here. At this point, he's controlling the center of me. It's hard for me to move anywhere. What I want to do is step out to the side in base, and at the same time, put my forearm up this way. So my body is stepping this way, and my arms are pushing this way. Once again, it's important to use the thumb side bone. Some schools teach it like this with the fat of it but I want to have more pressure inward and a tighter pinch on his wrist. You'll see why in a minute. So I want to turn the thumb that way and use both hands to push this way. So my body's stepping this way, my arm's pushing that way. At this point, 75% of me is on the outside of him. It's really difficult for him to headbutt me or knee me from here. As he pushes into me, I'm going to circle and let his force move around me. You can see that my left foot is basically making small steps and I'm just rotating around the center. This by itself is a really, really important concept because as I mentioned so many times in the real world, how much pressure he's putting on you is the danger. I've had students of mine that were severely injured because they were pushed into traffic. Or myself, I've been in real world fights where I had to push people downstairs. I let the stairs do the work for me. So anytime somebody gets their hands on you, it's really dangerous. He could push me into a wall, he could push me off a building ledge, he could push me into traffic. I need to make sure that I can stay offline of him. So if his plan is to knee me or headbutt me, then that's a problem, but it's not as dangerous as going down seven flights of stairs. As he drives into me, I step off line. And it's really hard for him to push me in a straight line, and I can circle around. That's the first step. The second step now is to use this position to break the grip, which is what it's classically used for. Let's take a look at that. If he's pushing on me, his hands tend to come together. His arms begin to straighten, and they come together. In fact, if he's pushing very hard, they may become very close and it would be difficult for me to do the weaving motion. So as I step out, my bone is pushing the bones of his arms together here. And it's important that I'm pushing right against the edge of the bend of his wrist. This begins to make his wrist bend like this. So once again, 
I'm trying to fight with the weakest part of his arm, just the end of it, just the grip. I don't want to fight with his big shoulders. I don't want to fight with his big arms. I want to fight with the wrist. Now, it's more difficult to make a wrist bend this way, but it can be done. So that's your first point of leverage. I want to drive the hands here. If he isn't holding as tight as he can, that's often enough to rip out. Sometimes a person gets his hands on fast and starts to work, but he doesn't have time to sit there and go like this. and get the mechanically strongest grip that's possible. We're talking about real time here. He's going to hit me and get his grip as quick as he can. A lot of the time, that's enough leverage to break. Secondly, if it's not, we have a second and a third line of leverage. Let's take a look at that. He grabs me here. The first idea, I've got to get offline and keep my balance. Then I want to drive his two wrists together and get right against the bend of his arm like this. Now, sometimes that's enough to break the grip, sometimes it's not. The second line of leverage now is to make his wrist bend this way. So I'm going to have pressure this way. That's making his, his grip weaker because his wrist is beginning to bend that way. And then I'm going to attack it from the bottom, which begins to go like this. I do that by raising my arm up. Basically, his two hands are caught in the crook of my arm, or at least lined up with it. So I push in, and then I go up. So I have two lines of attack there. Traditionally, this isn't taught. I don't know if people know this kind of leverage because they ignore a lot of the basic Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu self-defense, and I think that's a big mistake. These are things, again, I've used in the real world, so I had to break them down, figure out what was actually working. The classical way to break this is to prevent him from circling with you. A lot of the time when I do this, he feels the pressure on his wrist, and his body will circle this way, and it takes the pressure off. He's not any danger to you, except he still has his grip. But you're not going to be able to break a grip usually with one-way action if you do it, especially with the flat of your arm like that. So what we do traditionally is we stop him from coming around is by hooking his hip, and then I can break through. Works real nice in the academy. Never done it on the street. There's no way I feel comfortable hopping around with one leg, no matter how well it worked in the academy. So I had to find out ways to increase the leverage, keeping my feet on the ground. So that's the first two I've shown you. This alone, if you catch it early and push hard, but you've got to pull in and make sure you're driving against the bend of his wrist. That's how you maximize your pressure, like this. And do it from the hip. Bang. Got a good chance of breaking it. It's not complete. Then, if let's say I only weaken his grip, I can then go up. That is a nice one because it's not as contingent upon him not moving sideways. All right. So let's review the breaking the grip phase of this. Once his hands are on you, you step to one side and you put his wrists around the corner the other way. This puts 75% of my body on one side of him. Now I have to get his hands off me. I go through a three step process where I get increasing leverage until the grip is broken. The first one is just making sure you're using the inside edge of your arm. My thumb points this way. Also, I want to suck it back as far as I can. So my forearm is right against the back of his hand if his wrist is bending, which is what I'm trying to do. This begins to compromise his wrist here. Many times in the real world, he hasn't had time to get the ultimately strongest grip that he can get, and I just need to make those wrists bend and use the hips to power it off. That works a good 50, 60, 70% of the time. Secondly, I'm now going to cause the leverage to hit from the bottom at the same time. So his wrists are already beginning to compromise like this. Then I'm going to hit from the bottom and make him do this. This is an important one and often left out because he can't counter it as much by, by circling around with me. It's more up and down pressure and there's less he can do about it. So when I come here, I give him a hard snap. It doesn't come off, but look, I've started to weak the grip. Now his two wrists should be lined up with the crook of my arm, my elbow. I want the bottom of my arm to hit here again, as close as I can to the bends of his wrist. That should break it off. If it doesn't, we've got the third old school approach, which gives you a lot of leverage because it holds them in place, but you're balancing on one leg. Sure, it works fine in the academy. All kinds of stuff work well in the academy. In the real world, I've never felt secure enough to be bouncing around on one leg. This is something that's a theoretical defense, but maybe you've got a better sense of balance or more confident in the technique than I did. So let's look at the third version. This is the first one. Leverage comes this way with the bone of your arm. Secondly, I use the crook here 
thirdly, I have to get close to him and block his hip so there's no rotation and taking pressure off here. And then I can just combine those two again as I keep his hip in place. And then the classically, they give the elbow.